John Pilger is an internationally renowned journalist. He has reported on wars in Asia, the Middle East, Africa and the Americas during a career spanning seven decades. He has also produced over 60 award-winning documentary films. In 2016, his documentary entitled The Coming War on China revealed a historic buildup by US military forces in the Asia Pacific with a hostile intent towards China. John Pilger, can I ask you, it's been six years since your documentary, The Coming War on China was first aired. The hostile mm -hmm. tensions between the United States and China have increased dramatically, although war has not happened yet. Do you still see the eruption of an armed conflict as being a grave danger? It's certainly a degree of danger. Uh, <laughs> I don't think the two countries are as yet close to war, though what we're seeing is a whole series of escalations. Escalation, an old word from the first Cold War, is back again. So you see, uh, instead of something being dealt with by diplomacy, by negotiation, it moves up to the next stage. And that's certainly what's happening with China. For example, just I think a week or so ago, uh, President Biden signed into law uh, um, a, a, um, a bill sent to him from Congress that would uh, ban the Chinese from buying uh, American semiconductors. Uh, now, the United States dominates the world market in these powerful microchips, semiconductors, and its biggest customer by far is China. China uses them to progress its own tech industries, or rather to protect, protest the American tech industries that it hosts. I mean, China has some of the biggest companies in the world on its soil, and they're mostly American, like Apple, for example. So in bringing in, 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 I think, blocking that trade in such a critical material, the US has escalated it to the next stage. That doesn't mean to say that war is around the, around the corner, but it's becoming increasingly more dangerous, yes. Over the past six years, the United States, that is the, the White House, uh, the Pentagon and, and the, the Congress, have published several strategic documents that increasingly label China as America's biggest long-term security threat. No. What explains America's obsession with portraying China as an existential enemy or threat? What is this obsession about? What's driving the American fear of China? Well, it's a $64,000 question, isn't it? And it really has a history. Because, you know, who was it? Well, several have said it. Solzhenitsyn said it, that uh, the, the West, as he put it, but he really meant the United States, was blinded by this sense of its supremacy. Uh, and uh, uh, Richard Falk uh, put it extremely well when he said it provided this, and I paraphrase him, this kind of divine right uh, for the, the West, for the United States to have an entitlement. Uh, and it, that is so, that's so irrational but it's so evident, it's so present in all of this. Um, there is a history with China, um, and it's a deeply racist past. China, the Chinese are the only people who've been banned outright by a law of Congress from the, entering the United States for almost a hundred years, right up to the early years of the Second World War, 
no Chinese was allowed to enter the United States without very special permission. Uh, and it was based simply on race. Why? Why, why, have, why has the U.S. It's had this strange relationship with China? It regarded China as theirs. In the same way the British did uh, around the time of the Opium Wars, but that was a more of a hard-nosed view. The, the Americans took this, dressed up their imperialism in China with a kind of romanticism. They had, uh, um, you know, um, people like the, the novelist Pearl Buck, her, her book, I think, memory called The Sacred Earth, which was this massive bestseller in the, the United States. Uh, missionaries flocked to China. China was ours. China was the place that we were civilizing. China also happened to be a source of extraordinary riches that poured into the East Coast establishment in the United States. Uh, into some very famous names, uh, such as uh, um, uh, Franklin Delano's grandfather, who was uh, Roosevelt, sorry, Roosevelt, President Roosevelt's grandfather, Delano. Uh, these people made riches from China, but wanted to hold China in their, in their collective consciousness as, as a benign place, a place that we would would civilize. Now, you know, this was a time of the most humiliating imperialism in China and of great violence. And I don't think the United States has ever really got over that. Um, it, it's it's the fact that the the Chinese in just over a generation rose to almost be their equal in so many ways. I mentioned earlier there being uh, there's a ban now on semiconductors. I mean that we're even talking about that now. China has made itself into this technological giant economic giant, not just the workshop of the world, but uh, a scientific uh, 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 leviathan that um, is interested in one thing, actually, and that is trading and development, its own development, which it conducts with its five-year plans, uh, with its historic... Uh, lifting of poverty of millions out of poverty of millions of people the creation of an entire middle class this this is this is one of the great um positive developmental upheavals in human history it's extraordinary really the achievement in china uh, of what has happened in in the last 30 to 40 years. All of it, though, is a threat to the dominant world power. Uh, they are threatened. Uh, they're still dominant in so many ways. They're dominant in, in so much of trade, of ownership, of corporate ownership around the world, and of course, militarily. But it has terrified them. Their place at the top uh, is in is in is has been challenged and is is likely to be toppled. So trying to stop this, of course, if they can't stop it, but they might try and stop it in a very in a way that produces something very um, um, very reckless, and that is the possible war. The Chinese want war. It's the last thing they want. Mm. They they worry about their great ally, Russia, having the war in Ukraine. So we have a very dangerous situation here. Mm. Taiwan today is a potential flashpoint. 
And do you, do you see any comparison between Taiwan and Ukraine, whereby the United States is massively arming Taiwan as a provocation towards China, in the same way that Ukraine was massively armed by the United States over the past eight years and used as a provocation towards Russia. Do you see a comparison here? Yes. Well, it's being used as a comparison. Uh, and uh, what it's doing is disturbing um, a relationship. What of what have they called it in international circles, international diplomacy, diplomatic language, creative ambiguity that have, uh, uh, I mean, China, as I understood it when I was last there some years ago, was quite prepared to consider um, the uh, one nation, two systems one that has worked in Hong Kong in spite of the recent uh, attempts to of of uh, um, of many young Hong Kong ladies to challenge it. Uh, it has worked in Hong Kong by and large. That's you know Taiwan. You, you stand in Shanghai Airport and look at the airport uh, departures and arrivals. And there's there's one, it seems there's one every five minutes from Taiwan. They, it, it's, there's, there's no restriction. The great company, I mean, ironically, the company making the semiconductors that I mentioned, which the United States is now banning, uh, is actually made in Taiwan. So the, the entwining of of Taiwan, which unlike Ukraine, is a homogeneous part of China. Ukraine is is split between different peoples in the the south and east. Uh, there are Russian speaking peoples uh, with a different language and a different tradition, uh, and so it is a country something of a patchwork, uh, but not Taiwan. Taiwan, they're Chinese, just like they are across the Straits of Formosa. Uh, and the idea that China, that uh, Taiwan is, um, I mean, Taiwan was a really terrible tyranny. It's held up now as an example of democracy under Chiang Kai-shek until um, his and his uh, um, those who took over from him and until the early 90s. Um, but Taiwan's distinction is that it's where Chiang Kai-shek, beaten, who was beaten by Mao's communist army uh, in 1949, where he fled and where he received an enormous amount of American money to fight Mao Zedong. That's its only distinction. Otherwise, it's part of China. Mm. Yes. But the, the systematic um, arming of Taiwan over, since Obama's administration, the pivot to Asia, which you highlighted in your documentary, since Obama's administration and the pivot to Asia, um, several administrations have been arming Taiwan massively. Yes multi-billion dollar weapon sales, effectively a, a part of China's territory under Beijing's sovereignty, and yet the United States is arming that island territory, that breakaway territory, with these massive arms sales. One does speculate that there is a deliberate provocation going on here to provoke China. Well, yes, I mean, you know, countries like Taiwan and Ukraine become cults in the United States. They develop their own rather manic um, support among the really extreme elements in Congress and in the national security state in Washington because they see them as a vehicle to attack 
uh, the great communist giant. Uh, um, you know, China, although for a period of time, China and the United States seem to be getting along extremely well, it's now back to being red China and the, the place where all uh, dark events happen and so on. So the that that's the problem. So you you we witness extraordinary provocative events like uh, the Speaker of the the House Nancy Pelosi flying in there uh, uh, in defiance of a one China policy which her own government had long ago agreed to pursue uh, a straight provocation. To the Chinese, and and you see the danger that really comes from all of this is that in China, and I saw the beginning of it, a state of siege develops. When I was there um, six years ago, they were still scratching their heads and saying, "Why is this happening? Why are we seeing the beginning of such hostile acts, such provocations here and there?" Well, of course, since then, there's been so many provocations. And China has this, is you can see this fortress China developing. Now, that's that becomes dangerous because what it will do is develop its military. Uh, there is some suggestion it's already placed its nuclear weapons from low alert as they always have been, now on to higher level. Um, all of this is, is unnecessary. There's no real dispute between China and the United States. The only dispute is how the United States reconciles with the fact that there is another economic power uh, as great or almost as great as itself. Uh, no one is going to war with the United States, attacking the United States. There's no, there's no Chinese arms flowing into Mexico or into Canada to, uh, it's the same. It's exactly the same. I mean, this, the idea that you, one reverses this, it's, it's like Ukraine and Russia. Um, well, what's Putin on about? He's worried about having NATO on his Western borders. So what? Can you imagine having Russian forces on the border uh, with Mexico and the United States? Uh, it's beyond consideration. We know what we know what happened with the Cuban Missile Crisis. So this these countries unnecessarily, and I stress that word, become flashpoints. Finally, we, ha we have midterm elections this week in the United States. And given that the uh, U.S. hostility towards China has prevailed in both Democrat and Republican administrations, what needs to happen in the United States beyond elections in order for its foreign policy to become less belligerent, and for the United States to adopt a normal, cooperative, and dare I say, more peaceful international relations. What needs to happen in the United States to change it all around? Look, it, it, American foreign policy has always been like that. It's always been rapacious. Uh, at some periods, it's been less rapacious than during others. Um, perhaps during the period of FDR, of Roosevelt, in, in the 30s. But once the Second World War had established America as great power, great military power, it has been, has been a U.S. foreign policy is run in a straight line, and whoever president is irrelevant. And that includes Donald Trump. Uh, it doesn't matter, 
because the way the system works in the United States is that um, it regards itself as the as number one in the world uh, with um, the right to control areas of the world, with the right to control the sources of fossil fuel and of certain seas and lands and um, and trade and the right to for its companies, its great corporations to dominate. Uh, this is a divine right. Uh, it doesn't have the right, of course. Um, and I think going back to what we were originally talking about, it's really how, and I suppose in answer to your this last question of yours, it's how the US copes with the emergence of a multipolar world. That is a world where um, there are, it's uneven, but there isn't one great power that dominates at all. There isn't a Britain running up the greatest empire on earth. There isn't the United States, let's say, in 1950. There is a different one. There is a powerful United States, but there is also a powerful China looking after its own sphere of influence. There is a Russia that uh, has risen from the chaos of the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, and it deserves its own place. Um, there is a Europe trying to sort out whatever Europe thinks it is, God knows these days. Um, so this is a this is the jargon is this is a multipolar world, not one dominated by one. Yeah. Uh, but in the past, the U.S. has coped with change. There's no doubt about that. The U.S. Uh, the the architects of some of the uh, the the nuclear treaties that George W. Bush tore up. Uh, I met a number of them were extraordinary men. Um, but whether those people, that era of, let's say, aggressive diplomacy can be reclaimed, um, I don't know. But at the moment, it's, it's, it's one of, uh, of risk-taking. That's, that's what's so reckless about what is happening now, the, the risks that are being taken. Mm. Last week, uh, the Chinese President Xi Jinping um, called on the United States to enter into a cooperative relationship and to um, to renounce the Cold War mentality. I think that seems to be the challenge. Can the United States renounce a Cold War mentality? I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, it's a bit, um, you know... Can the Pope denounce Catholicism? I don't know. But, I mean, there's a comparison there because, really, the United States acts in the world like the papacy did in the 4th and 5th century. Uh, this is, uh, a, you know, there's, we, we, are, we, are the, we are the force. We are the, the source of all knowledge, wisdom, and power. Uh, uh, it's extraordinary to hear it spoken in the 21st century, but it's there. Now, whether it can renounce that, I don't know. Uh, countries like Britain, uh, its closest ally, some would say closest vassal, but closest ally, uh, uh, can, can play a part. But look at the chaos in Britain. Uh, politically and the extremes that we now see reflected in the government in Britain. Um, Europe can play its part. In other words, it's pressure from other countries. But at the moment, the US has got to the point where it has successfully intimidated its own sphere of influence and all those, those in it. Um, so I'm not, I'm, 
I'm not too hopeful. I um, I think if Ukraine can be resolved peacefully and that the Minsk conferences, the spirit of those uh, gives some security to uh, the Russians and allows for that war to stop, maybe. But look, I'm not a futurist, really, and I'm I'm here guessing, and I don't I don't really prefer not to do that. Um, it's a volatile time. That's it's a disorientate disorientating volatile time, and with so many weapons now, the great beneficiaries, of course, are the are these merchants of death, the great arms companies, something like $230 billion worth of weapons and arms have poured into this relatively small country of Ukraine um, this year. But that's a shocking, that's a shocking fact. And uh, it's a very dangerous one as well. John Pilger, thank you for your insights. You're very welcome. Thank you.